In Tehran is warning the United States following last week's deadly airstrikes on Iranian-linked bases in Syria. A spokesperson for Iran's top security body said U.S. strikes on military bases in that country would draw a, quote, immediate counter-response. The airstrikes killed 19 people in eastern Syria. The United States carried them out in retaliation against a drone attack on a coalition base in Syria that killed one American and wounded several others, including five U.S. service members. Joining us now is CBS News foreign policy and national security contributor H.R. McMaster. He's a retired U.S. Army lieutenant general and a former U.S. national security advisor. Uh, general, good to have you on this Monday. Uh, so there were several more strikes against U.S. bases in Syria following those airstrikes carried out by the United States last week. How much further can we expect Iran to go in its response to U.S. actions? Hey, Vlad, Emery, great to be with you. Hey, this is just really a continuation of what we might call the four-decade-plus-long proxy war that the, that the Iranian regime, you know, that the theocratic dictatorship in Tehran has been waging against us, its Arab neighbors, and, and, and Israel. And so this shouldn't be surprising. I think what's really going to be important, Vlad, is what the response is from us. I mean, do we impose costs on Iran that acknowledge that, hey, we know what the return address is. You know, what they try to do is use these cutouts of these militias and, and act as if it wasn't really Tehran behind them. But of course, it's Tehran that is behind these attacks. So, you know, there's a delicate dance here, right? You want to deter this sort of behavior, but you don't want to inflame things. What can officials yeah. do to better protect American bases in Syria? Hey, Emery, I think it's time to be a, a lot less delicate. Mm. <laughs> That's what I think. I mean, I, I mean, this is, you know, this is a regime that that acts like, you know, it's strong with the, the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps. That's the organization that runs these militia and, and proxy terrorist organizations. But actually, they're quite weak, Emery. I mean, they, they have, you know, they have huge economic problems. And of course, remember, after the murder, you know, of, of the teenager Masa Amini, there have been a lot of a lot of you know, street protests and 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 anger about the nature of the, of the regime. Uh, I think people in Iran are really getting tired of the regime putting all of its resources into these proxy wars and also the resources into the nuclear and and other weapons programs. Uh, while while the Iranian people are, are you know are deprived of of really you know, the great bounty of that country and the rich culture of that country. I mean, they ought to be a member you know, of the international community, uh, but their rulers have made them a pariah state. Hmm. Um, and so, as you know, these recent attacks mark one of the deadliest exchanges between the U.S. and Iranian-aligned forces in, in years. So I guess the question is, for the United States and Iran, the relationship, such as it exists, if there even is one, where does it go from here? Is any kind of reconciliation possible? I don't think so, not under this regime. And and this is because of the nature of, of, of the theocratic dictatorship there. You know, there was a time, I think, maybe, Vlad, when there was this competition between the revolutionaries and what some people call the Republicans. But hey, the revolutionaries won and they're and they're in power. And and they, they use this power, you know, to wage these proxy wars, but also to to repress their, their own people. They've been able to consolidate power in a number of ways. Of course, they're brutal. Right, we've seen that uh, with the arrests and, the, and then the executions of of protesters after the after the murder of Masa Amini for not wearing a you know a headscarf properly. She was beaten to death. Uh, but we've also you know we've also seen uh, them in intensify uh, at times these these proxy wars a a against us. And I, and I think that you know we have to be ready. I think to impose costs on on Tehran beyond those that they factor into their decision making. I mean these these proxy forces are acting as an arm of the Iranians. I think we've made a mistake, Vlad, of supplicating to them uh, in recent years uh, in, in, this, in this effort to renew what was a terrible nuclear deal with the Iranians. And I think this effort by us, you know, to, to supplicate to them, to be in these indirect negotiations, using the Russians as, as mediators, uh, I think it made us look extraordinarily weak and, and maybe encouraged the Iranian regime to think, hey, we can get away with this. Um, listen, before we let you go, I want to ask you at least one question about China. China is threatening, quote, serious consequences after the U.S. Navy sent a warship into the South China Sea. China sea. I want to get a sense of what you think is driving the U.S. forces movement around this disputed region and what could those serious consequences look like? 
Well, Amory, hey, nobody owns the ocean, right? That's got to really be the, the main message that we send to them. I mean, China is in the midst of trying to achieve the maybe the, the largest land grab, so to speak, in history in the South China Sea. They've laid claim to this nine dash line, which would put China in charge of the, you know, the ocean and the airspace over the, the area over which one third of the world's surface trade flows. So that's just not acceptable. In fact, you know, in, in 2016, a tribunal in The Hague ruled against China's claims and said these are baseless claims. So I think we ought to be sailing our ships, other nations sailing their ships through there routinely. You know, for a while, when I when I first became National Security Advisor a long, long time ago, 2017, it was a big deal, like whenever we would sail through the South China Sea and we effected a change in policy. We said, hey, stop making a big deal of this. This is the, this is the ocean. China doesn't own the ocean. But I think, Amory, we ought to be cognizant of the fact that there could be a clash over this. Remember the, the 2001 Hainan Island incident when a, a, uh, a Chinese fighter rammed into a U.S. surveillance aircraft and forced it to land on Hainan Island. They, they held, you know, they, they held our, our air crew hostage for, you know, for, for a, a week or so. Um, and so I think we have to be prepared, you know, for China to be even more aggressive. You know, China's been, I mean, they've been ramming and sinking vessels in the South China Sea. They rammed and sank a, a Vietnamese vessel. They've been arming these these islands that they're building. So, you know, we focus a lot on Taiwan and we should, but I think probably the most dangerous flashpoint with China is the South China Sea. Uh, H.R. McMaster, always good having you. If you're interested in more of his opinion on what's happening in the world, check out his book, Battlegrounds, The Fight to Defend the Free World, because you talk about all of all this All these issues yeah. are described in your book, so. Yeah, thank you. Well, thanks, great to be with both of you. Take care.